you know, with a coffee or tea on the desk, you flip open your laptop and you discover an email from a former student. It might just be a touch base to let you know what they're doing and where they are, or perhaps it's to thank you for influencing their educational journey. And those emails are one of many joys of being an educator, right? As educators, we love to hear about the impact we have. Sometimes it takes a while, and sometimes it comes as a surprise, it, but it is a reminder of the privilege and honor and responsibility of being a professor and instructor who teaches in a way that recognizes students as indispensable, to quote Joe Ledoux at the beginning of our proceedings. You know, if you take the time to ask, these students will frequently offer a valuable understanding of how our work connects and this is, this, is, this is the generation that's creating the next in products and services and enterprises that will change and shape our society and world. So over the next half hour, let's take an opportunity to talk to a graduate, perhaps like one of yours, that's working to push the envelope on progress. This will give us an opportunity to hear and ask questions such as, what do you think of the application of the entrepreneurial mindset and the three C's work in the wild world of work. So please welcome to the stage, the virtual stage, Ryan David. He's planned to share some of his current work and his personal entrepreneurial journey that started as an engineering student at a Keen Partner School. Now his career finds him more than a decade later working at a world-class, a collection of world-class innovative companies like Apple, Tesla, now at Rivian Automotive as a system architect. Ryan will share how his engineering education prepared him for quite literally a wild and rewarding ride. First of all, Ryan, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Now, if you don't mind, I'm gonna share your LinkedIn page. People can find it, but there's a few things to highlight here. I'll share it with our friends here at the conference. So just take a look as this scrolls by. And you'll see just a variety of companies that Ryan has served uh, in his career so far, probably many more to come or really not, we don't know, but we know that the innovation uh, started at some point, perhaps it was connected to education, perhaps not. I'm going to ask even now, early on in our interview process, if you have questions that you would like to um, ask Ryan, start putting those into the chat, into the Whova chat, and near the end of our presentation, I'll do a little moderating on those. But with that, let's take a look at a little bit of what Ryan has been doing. So, oh, I got to embarrass you a little bit, Ryan. This is, uh, this is an old picture of Ryan when he started the first company that I knew he started called Redline. Um, a red line, we won't go into the details. He can share some of that, but red line was a company that built electronics. Am I correct, Ryan? Built electronics for mm, vehicles for automotive, but even racing, if I if I remember correctly. Yep, exactly. Now, fast forward, he's working on something that has made a lot of news lately. In fact, in one of the QA sessions, uh, one of the questioners points out that. It's making the news in the New Yorker. It's made a lot of news. You can find a lot of press right now around this current company, their current offerings that are breaking some new ground. And it's based on an electric vehicle platform. And, you know, even the, uh, uh, I think there might be a little clip of a video here. Let's see if this runs. Oh, good. Yeah, I grabbed a little clip of some footage that I found around this new truck. And I know that you have other things, uh, other vehicles that you're working on, but just a little clip of, of something as it's going across the Trans-American Trail, one of its journeys that the company put the truck through. I thought that was kind of an apropos um, metaphor, if you will. I mean, I've known Ryan for a while. I've seen and uh, enjoyed those connections over the years as he's made a journey in his career. And he is continuing to take that journey. One of the things I'll, I'll just maybe metaphorically use for our talk is that the map is never the territory. Whether it's trying to bring out a new product and you have all these best laid plans, or whether it's trying to teach a course 
or even the mathematical and simulation models, they are not the full range. They're not the entire territory. It's a good metaphor for starting off. Ryan, I'm going to turn it over to you and you take us through a little bit of what you've got to share today. Um, we are just pleased to have somebody here that can talk about the work that we're focused on. And it's, it's, uh, it's aimed at folks like you. Awesome. Yeah, thank you again for having me. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to this audience. Um, so I'm Ryan. I am a system architect at Rivian. Um, really what that means, oh, apologies. Uh, yeah, so a uh, quick background. Uh, so Rivian, uh, thanks for the great introduction. Uh, we're an electric truck, well, a suite of electric vehicles. And if you really want to nerd out on the specs, I put the specs there, but uh, really what it distills down to is just an all around awesome truck. Um, so yeah, there was mentions of the New Yorker, uh, Car and Driver just recently did a video, uh, More Trend Awarded Truck of the Year. Um, and I also put a photo in there that um, I had the opportunity to eat my own dog food. So me and my wife uh, took delivery of our own truck and uh, we've had the opportunity to take off road and explore and put it through its paces. Um, so it's, uh, it's an awesome, awesome feeling to see kind of the realization of the, the effort and then the work put into something. Um, so what does a system architect do? Um, really, uh, if I put my sense or my architect hat on to it, everything distills down into either a controller, a sensor, or an actuator. And you could think of a controller like a brake controller or a propulsion controller, something that actually contains the logics and the smarts to actually do something useful on the vehicle. Um, and work with a, a, a wide different amount of people within the team to actually start putting plumbing together uh, between these various controllers and sensors and actuators. So the tools in my toolkit are um, different networks. And we have automotive specific networks like CAN or LIN. Um, and then the cool thing, what I nerd out about is uh, bringing in stuff like Ethernet, um, same Ethernet you plug into your desktop computer, uh, we now have in the vehicle. Um, so the R1T that we're shipping has an Ethernet backbone. We can do some really, really cool things with that. Um, and so it's not just um, the one surface of the electrical or kind of software. There's a whole uh, slew of stakeholders here. And it's really trying to optimize uh, this network across all these different stakeholders. So I put on here that we have software teams, hardware teams, cybersecurity teams, which um, uh, seems pretty obvious with all the recent news about uh, attacks on vehicles. Functional safety, how do we distill safety into like the DNA of the product so it's intrinsically safe? Um, user experience, obviously we're building something that's gonna be sold to a customer. We gotta make the user experience great. Um, homologation, how do we uh, make sure it conforms to all the um, uh, different country regulations and program. Ultimately, we got to ship this thing and make sure it comes on time and on, on budget. Um, so I put a little joke in there. It's uh, a game of optimization. So you can't make everybody happy. You can just make everybody equally unhappy. Um, so it, there's another dimension too. So uh, a colleague, so this is his baby, um, but I brought it into this because I think it shows a, a kind of a different cross section of those same um, activities I just described for the vehicle network, but it's uh, vehicle power modes. And really that's a fancy way to say, how does the car actually power up and get ready to drive? Um, and the, the closest analog that you have today in traditional uh, combustion vehicles is your ignition switch. So you put your switch in and you have options to go from accessory to on to actually crank the vehicle on. It kind of gets difficult when you say, okay, well, I want to use a phone. I don't have a, a physical key that I expect the, the user to um, operate the vehicle. I just want to do it passively using something that they have on their person already. So it seemingly, uh, it seems straightforward. You say, okay, well, they jump in the car, the car starts up. Um, but the problem is uh, you have these different things like accessory mode. It's tough to try and uh, uh, infer what the user actually wants to do with the vehicle at any time. And what you're trying to optimize is the power budget, how much power you actually consume while the vehicle is not doing anything useful. Um, so again, there's a whole bunch of different um, uh, cross section, like kind of cross team, cross organizational stakeholders in here. Um, 
So from software is like, how do you actually coordinate uh, waking up the vehicle, powering up only the sections of the vehicle that need to be awake at a certain time? Um, hardware, uh, how do we make sure that the hardware supports waking up from these different things? If I push the button on the tailgate, how does that propagate up to ultimately wake the vehicle? Um, user experience, again, we wanna make sure that it's um, a, a, a joy and actual like good experience for somebody to use this, something that's painless and seamless. And again, homologation, make sure that we're satisfying all the um, requirements to make for different countries. And then, um, yeah, you can imagine all these different stakeholders, all each have their own uh, kind of vein or different dimensions on how the ultimate like system gets put together and how it's designed and how it's executed. Brian, can I ask a question? Sure. So, you know, when you have, um this variety of stakeholders and a, a new product like this, one of the first things that I think we naturally think about is the surprise and delight of that end customer. Mm -hmm. I know, but we know that engineering is so frequently projects like this are team sport mm -hmm. and it takes a number, a lot of the stakeholders are internal. So the mm -hmm. things you're developing they're they are, they're for, they're for other groups, for example. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the surprise and delight. I mean, how do you think how do you think of these other stakeholder groups, especially the internal ones, not just the final customer? Yeah, so I think there's uh, the same things that you could do for surprise delight is um, it, it directly translates to internal customers. Um, so you could do it in a very micro scale of surprise and delight. You can have um, uh, really just kind of going above and beyond over delivering, trying to make the, the, your downstream partners, uh, the deliverable that you give to them, make their life easier. Um, there's also kind of, a, you can rally people um, to say like, almost wouldn't it be cool if we could do such and such and this. And so maybe it's not necessarily something that gets delivered in the end product, but it could be a process. It could be a methodology. It could be anything to help um, really enable others to be able to do their job more effectively. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's a, a perfect segue because uh, really when I was taking a step back and preparing all this, I was trying to say, okay, well, we have this product design cycle. You go from something that's a very concept and you go through and iterate and mature it all the way to something where you're saying, I'm delivering it to a customer and um, I'm, I'm servicing it in the field in really, I was trying to say those three C's, they really uh, apply across this whole product life cycle. Um, so I, I try to take one example, and I, I think this is a perfect example of an internal uh, customer, an internal use case where these three C's still apply. Um, you won't necessarily find uh, the, the product of this uh, in the truck, like you, you're not buying uh, the, the artifact of this. But what you're actually, um, what it helped do is help the teams that are, are working on those user facing features move faster. Um, so from a very high level, it's um, really trying to describe of how these different uh, controllers in the vehicle um, communicate. So we uh, defined the physical network. So we took those CAN buses, those LIN buses, those Ethernet networks. Um, and now we need to define the protocols and the communication between those different controllers. And so again, I put an example here of saying, okay, you might have a brake controller that's talking to your propulsion module um, and it needs to be able to communicate how fast the wheels are spinning. So there's a whole bunch of gory details in here, but it's ultimately saying, okay, I need wheel speeds to be transmitted from point A to point B. And really how that was uh, um, being executed within the company was uh, this process. And I won't bore you with the details, but really running this loop and turning the crank on this process took weeks and it was painful. <laughs> so um, really uh, there was issues with the, uh, all different spots of it. Um, so human factors, process factors, tooling issues, um, it really uh, morphed into this uh, hairy beast of saying, okay, we can do better. Um, so going back to kind of the, the uh, life cycle is we can take that same life cycle we would say for like a physical product, but then also apply it to uh, this uh, more process or methodology or internal customer 
Um, so really, the first thing is to identify um, the problem statement. So really here, I, I'm kind of a stickler on it, but we need to make sure that uh, you have the problem statement very, very clearly defined. Um, I also put here saying, uh, you also need to have a clear exit criteria. What does success look like in um, uh, as an outcome here? Ryan, could I interrupt with another question? Yeah, of course. So, you know, one of the things you just mentioned around finding and having a clarity around problem statement, the missing piece from, from maybe that description is actually what you're doing about the problem finding. Because some of, some of I know from talking to you about uh, projects and our previous conversations, that it's no one's handing you this problem statement. And if you could talk a little bit about the problem finding, and I know this audience is interested in the mindset piece around this as well, because there are elements maybe are, that aren't even captured in our framework about the feeling of ownership of this product that, that sends you on your way of finding problems. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk about two things? So one is the problem finding, and two, the mindset that really equips that. Sure. Yeah, so the, um, I think it really distills down to um, probably just the curiosity, just to say, like, we have, like, uh, what we have today and what we're given today doesn't necessarily have to be the, the what we continue with. Um, so trying to say, how could we do this better? Um, <laughs> really almost this to say like this doesn't smell right to me like uh, we have this very painful issue or um maybe the product or uh what we're developing uh, that gets delivered to the customer isn't working as as best as it could be um to say hey let's take a step back i think we can do better um so i think it's a combination of a couple of different things uh really the curiosity and then also having some rooting and saying, okay, like I know these things are in play. Either those are the right things to be in play, or let's let's reevaluate it. Um, let's change out a couple pieces. Let's uh, really tackle the root of what's going on here. Uh, so the uh, um, yeah, and so the. I, I th right here, the, the curiosity is saying, that I, I think there is room for improvement here. Like, I don't know exactly what it looks like, um, but let's figure it out. And so it, it's not necessarily one person, it could be a team of people that put their heads together. Um, and really people might have different perspectives of saying like, I have seen portions of this uh, done like this before, maybe that's not the greatest thing, but it's a launching pad to say, we can do something better. Thank and you. then, the, the the last bit here is making sure that it aligns with the the, the company and the organization and actually does uh, fulfill a need that's um, there. Um, so the um, yeah, aligning it to the, the kind of the roadmap of the team or the org. Yeah, let's continue. Ah, oh, I I know this figure. <laughs> And I've, I've heard you refer to this before. I'm gonna let you use the term, but maybe this is one of the, the dangers of entrepreneurial mindset. Um, maybe a, at least a kind of a guardrail or a caution. Uh, talk to us, I, I've heard you talk about this in the past. I think this would be great to share with our viewers. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's definitely a danger. Um, so the, the picture here is, um, what it's called as an architect astronaut is um, you get so divorced from what you're trying to solve and you ask uh, you almost go a little bit too uh, fundamental and too abstract and you lose sight of what you're trying to do so the joke here is you start out with one problem but then you end up asking the question well what is a truck and so you run into a, a very real danger of making sure you stay grounded and have a line of sight on what you're trying to solve, but then still balancing that with trying to like tackle the root of the problem. So it's, it's a very hard thing to describe because some things you might err on the side of a little bit more abstract to actually try and drive back forward to something tangible. Other things don't necessarily need that same level of um, abstraction. So it's not a hard, fast rule of saying, 
uh, I'm always going to draw a line here. It, it's really got to be feeling out based on what the problem statement is and how big the problem is, the scope of the problem, those type of things. Yeah, it's like you can keep asking why. Every you can always ask the question why to any answer given, and so at some point you you recognize there's a job to be done here, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, let's yeah. talk a little bit about another uh, opportunity and challenge. You know, keeping it. Uh, we talk sometimes about in our framework, we use this idea of contrarianism as uh, a positive, and we, we lump it under the category of curiosity. Could you talk about how, how you and your team use that? Yeah, uh, so I think the biggest thing is, um, one, just getting ideas out there, but then not being afraid to, one, challenge kind of the, the ideas that are being presented even if you, the challenging is wrong, um, or uh, be ready to defend, but also be able to be in position to change your mind as well. Um, really all these different things is uh, really moving the ball forward. So there's never um, a bad idea. Uh, it's uh, about just kind of taking different cross sections. And then a, a colleague, uh, the same one that does the vehicle power modes, we even just jump on, um, calls sometimes where we say okay bad idea go and it, it doesn't solve the idea is like exactly what it sounds it's a bad idea but then you get a thing where you're saying well okay what happens if we tweak this and well instead of that what happens if we pivot around here and we do this instead and i'd say nine uh, nine times out of ten that results in uh, something that's actually actionable something that we can uh, take to a larger audience take to a larger review so uh, it's always, uh, yeah, there's never a downside to being able to challenge something or being challenged, your ideas having challenged, it always moves the ball forward. That joint focus on creating value together is, is kind of the binding mechanism that, that allows that contrarianism to work, I, I suppose. Um, <laughs> I, I want to encourage our audience at this point to continue to add questions to the Q&A section of Whova, and that's where I'll, I'll grab some questions. I already see some questions in there that are asking about um, maybe where some of Ryan's entrepreneurial mindset came from, and so we'll get to that, but keep on, keep on sharing a little bit more about your current work. Sure. Um, so the, yep, the last thing on uh, this slide was, um, again, kind of back to the, the notion of an internal stakeholder is uh, what could I do to provide the most impact for either my team or the larger organization? So this is where you have opportunity to kind of uh, play around with what, what is actually possible. What can I do uh, to really uh, facilitate either the product or other teams? Um, and moving on to the next step is really the prototype phase. Um, again, just like making a, a physical prototype of uh, something, actually uh, uh, run through the motions of getting this new tooling or process or framework in place. Um, and the, the really cool thing, the really rewarding thing about this is it's usually, um, you get most bang for the buck for a little bit of investment. So you can usually prove out uh, your concepts and get line of sight and, um, and probably the more uh, Silicon Valley uh, startup style is really it's uh, pizza and beer. You can get a lot done with a, a group of people just hacking away at something on a Saturday. Um, in this case, it was a Saturday. And then by the end of the day, we had wheels spinning um, on the truck, which was super, super cool. Um, and again, this is a lot of opportunity to like reevaluate. Um, this whole progression shows linear, but there's also a little bit of iteration between any of these things. Um, so how can I over deliver? Is there anything I can tweak here to really um, make the end result that much better? Um, but also it's opportunity to have a say and check of saying, okay, well, is it performing as, as I expected? Or based on my gut feel, or what I know, kind of the first principles of uh, the different pieces I'm playing with, is this how it should be performing? Um, and then the, the um, big step here um, is manufacturing. Um, is really how to scale it out. So we have this toy uh, kind of line of sight proof concept and getting it out to um, a wide audience. So again, in this case, it was an internal team. 
Um, but there's a lot, a lot of effort to one, um, uh, demonstrate it to the team uh, uh, and get a uh, sign off consensus on it. Um, but then also um, making sure that it's fully documented, tested, and something that all the tools can reliably use. Um, so here, it's uh, really trying to make sure that um, we enable others as saying, okay, what can I produce as um, uh, for my downstream customers to really empower them? Um, what can I do um, so they can make decisions autonomously on their own that align with this overall uh, spirit? What can I do to empower them? Um, and just closing the loop on this. Um, so the end result was a good result, obviously. Um, I wouldn't show something that was a bad result, but um, we went from something that went from uh, really uh, days, if not weeks, down to something that's 10 minutes. And I think the, the cool thing here and the most rewarding um, aspect of it, so even if it wasn't something that we're delivering to an end customer, we see the teams that are using this uh, new process and new tool is uh, either the teams take it for granted. Uh, I overhear them in the office uh, talking about saying, um, oh, you just do X, Y, Z to be able to do this and then you move on to the next thing. Or they just, take it as status quo. They're like, oh, I'm going to go uh, change this and do this. And so it's super rewarding to take have all these developers be able to um, take all this for granted and not realize what work went into it to make their jobs and lives easier. Um, and so I think when we were talking previously, uh, I mentioned um, having this lever arm, this uh, being able to enable others to be able to do their job more effectively. and um, really be able to create this lever and be able to pull on this lever to like really enable others to do their job is the most rewarding. And it shows like it, um, it's not something that we deliver in the vehicle, but those developers are now delivering the features and the, the, the polish and the cool user experience that does get delivered in the end vehicle. I can jump in. I, you had a term when you mentioned this before, what did you, what did you phrase this lever arm as? Oh, uh, sorry, I'm going <laughs> blank. <laughs> I remember uh, it was the multiplier effect that you said. Yeah. yeah. And um, and I, that caught my ear because when I think of what faculty do, and we have a lot of faculty watching and, and thinking about uh, this process that you've gone through and are continuing to go through in your career, mm -hmm. that multiplier effect is actually what they're involved in too, right? Uh, enabling others uh, empowering others, both through a skill set and a mindset. You, it, it, I, I know from our discussions that your team has become entrepreneurial. I mean, the, you have figured out a way to deliver beyond the, the checklist of specifications mm -hmm. and create some potential wins that, that are even speculative by the, some of the things that you've done, that case study on how you reduce time and, and so on. Mm -hmm. You know, Entrepreneurship. There is a um, there's a author that authored material around entrepreneurship and coined the term in in the mid '80s, uh, Gifford ben Pinchot. And his Ten Commandments uh, include things like number one, come to work each day ready to be fired. Uh, number six is work underground uh, so long as you can because publicity triggers the corporate immune system. Um, number eight is it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. So sometimes you get this dark picture of entrepreneurship. It's like this thing that's going on that, that shouldn't be out in the light. But in the companies that you've worked in, and we're going to turn toward kind of more of your personal journey, how has entrepreneurship kind of, it's, has it been celebrated? Is it a very positive thing? Has it been enabled? Could you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I've been very fortunate that all the, the my experience so far has been um, very celebrated. Um, so it, it's at all different uh, portions of the company, all different levels. It's always uh, been very rewarding to um, be able to like be an entrepreneur within a company. So whether it's your own specific piece of code that you're working, your own project, or it's something, a, a feature that does get delivered to the, the customer, um, it's always been celebrated. 
And obviously it's always gotta be bounded. Um, I think some of those uh, kind of more uh, darker details uh, you mentioned might've been like the constraints of, okay, ultimately we gotta deliver it. Ultimately uh, it's gotta meet budget. Those are real constraints, but um, it's never uh, a fine line. It, it's always a, an optimization really, because you can say I can deliver X, Y, Z with these impacts. And then you can drive, take that forward, move that ball forward and get consensus to saying, yep, we're okay with these impacts. Uh, let's let's pull the trigger on that. We've been having some questions come in on that Q&A portion of Whova. And if you, uh, for any viewers, you can vote those up if you really like some questions that are already entered. We've got one that's got a few votes and I want to relay this question to you. And so here it comes. How do you understand all of these different use cases that various potential end users might desire and be delighted by? And I, I realize that you're at the you're at the engineering side of things. And so, how do you understand some of those situations? Having a really really good uh, uh, user experience team. <laughs> Um, so I really, um, yeah, ultimately, uh, I have to rely on them because if I go back to my, um, yeah, if I go down underground and hide in my cave as an engineer, I'm going to put a big red button on the side of the truck that does whatever I needed to do. And it's going to be awful experience, but it's going to do, do it, uh, exactly what you wanted to do. Um, so having them as a grounding, um, but the cool thing with like the different, uh, consumer facing products, um, is you can really like put on your hat of saying, if I was gonna actually buy this, what would I want it to do? And, uh, and a lot of times those actually come up as like real use cases. So um, usually what that manifests is stuff down to in the work that I do is actually putting those top, when you're actually going through and solving this problem of saying, we wanna solve for um, the camp kitchen. Um, let's put those user stories down as the problem statement saying, as a user, I want to be able to cook my omelet on the side of the truck. Um, so that way, as you keep on going through this process, you make sure you keep those in sight. You know exactly what you're solving for. And you can always do a sanity check to saying, am I really making this nice experience with this decision that I'm making down in the weeds? Great answer. I, and I just learned that I can cook my omelet on the side of the truck too. So that's <laughs> good. We got another great question here. As you've worked to translate the three C's to your career, how has it enabled you to influence or drive the culture of organizations you've engaged in? Um, that's it's, it's a tall question, right? How how have you how have you kind of shaped things? Um, so I, I think uh, that case study kind of highlights maybe one vein of it. Um, I've tried to really going back to that lever arm and the multiplicative effect is really um, the less discussions, less decisions I can be in and enable others to be able to drive forward them by itself, I think is a win, not only for my own personal sanity, but for the company and the, the teams involved. Um, so I think in my mind, it's always going back to um, how can I facilitate um, others to drive forward by themselves, put out the broad, broad brush strokes, so then saying, okay, this is the direction we want to go but then have people to uh, take their domain knowledge and their expertise and drive that forward. That's a great answer. Um, I've just got, we're just going to take one more question here, I think from the audience. And I think this is a great question to, to, to relate, you know, the, um, the actual work and actual career is really wild with messy, lots, lots of starts and stops and iterations and those sorts of things. Our faculty here are asking the question, irrespective of EM, what do you want to share or ask of educators? What would you, what would you tell new educators or, or educators that have been doing this for a while? Hmm. Great question. Um, so I think I would put it, so I guess maybe I answered this in a slightly different way as far as just taking a, a retrospective on what I thought was um, most enabling for me out of my own education. And I think it really comes down to the first principles, which I've been probably harping on a little bit too much, 
Um, but then also um, uh, the the curiosity portion of it, and maybe a, a third dimension of like the soft skills. And to kind of jumping through each one of those is the first principles is um, in each of the education or the classes that I had, there was kind of a spectrum of something that was very like rigidly textbook to something that was um, more just making sure that the fundamentals are understood. And um, I had one professor going through school saying, okay, well, let's, let's uh, treat this, let's linearize this, and let's distill it down to the concepts and let the computer do all the fancy magic of making sure we understand the response. Let's make sure that we have line of sight on what we're trying to solve, that this is passed, we can move forward. Um, and th that's been really a key enabler um, in my mind because it makes you let do decisions really fast and, and set a direction and do that leg work uh, as you go. Um, the, the, the soft skills um, one, I think it's a little bit more harder to teach. And to be honest, I don't know exactly how you would translate that into a traditional curriculum. But um, kind of strung through all the different slides I um, mentioned through there, there's a huge portion of soft skills is um, really seeking out kind of those dissenting opinions, but then also um, being ready to be able to have your mind changed as well. Um, and so a lot of that is uh, very, very removed from the technical aspects. It's, it's really trying to like understand the root of people's concerns, how they map to the technical solution and then change as you need it. Um, you know, I'm positive. I don't know how you would translate that necessarily into a traditional curriculum, um, but I, I think that's also a, a key piece of what I've been, um, what's been helpful and what's been enabling for me. Well, you know, that is one of the challenges of this body of educators and this movement is figuring out how to transform engineering education, make it meaningful for the individual and for society. And Ryan, thank you for sharing your voice in this. It's it's a pleasure. We don't always get this opportunity at a national conference to have somebody who's gone through a program uh, that's connected and is considered the three C's in their work and share that. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you again very much for having me.